everybody, I'm Becca with Free Tours by Foot. I'm here in Washington, D.C. to give you a virtual tour of Capitol Hill. If you're coming to D.C. or you know someone who's going to be visiting D.C. or you're local to D.C., uh, be sure to share this video. We want to make sure that lots of people can see some of our insider tips. And if you're willing to travel, we are offering walking tours up here on Capitol Hill and throughout Washington, D.C. So be sure to check the link below for more on that. Now, uh, Capitol Hill is, I think, one of the most iconic parts of Washington, D.C. This has been home to Congress, the legislative branch of the United States government since 1800. But to back it up just a little bit, uh, Washington, D.C. was created by an act of Congress in 1790. Uh, basically, what they did is they passed something called the Residence Act, which gave George Washington 10 years and zero dollars to create a new capital city from scratch. So George Washington, our first president, was very involved in the creation of this capital city. He didn't do it alone, though. He worked with a young Frenchman by the name of Pierre Charles L'Enfant to help map out Washington, D.C. L'Enfant would come down to survey this land to try to envision what the city would look like in his mind. And he came upon the area that we're standing on here. Uh, today, of course, we call this Capitol Hill, but in the 1790s, it was known as Jenkins Hill. L'Enfant reached the apex of Jenkins Hill and he was completely overwhelmed by what he saw. In every direction, there was just beautiful, untouched American land, hand selected by the father of our country. And in his notes, Pierre L'Enfant wrote that Jenkins Hill was a grand pedestal crying out for a superstructure. So when L'Enfant created the first map of Washington, D.C., he situated the United States Capitol building on Jenkins Hill. He made it that superstructure uh, kind of conjoining the city together. And if you look at our map, you'll notice that the streets converge here at the United States Capitol building. And I think that's a really important piece of symbolism. We have the voice of the people, our Congress, at the heart and soul of our nation's capital. Now the Capitol building isn't the only building up here on Capitol Hill, uh, so come along with me and I'm gonna show you a few other really interesting structures. So this beautiful building that you can see behind me is the Library of Congress. More specifically, it's the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress is the oldest cultural institution in the United States, originally founded in 1800. So this year, 2020, we're actually celebrating the 220th birthday of the Library of Congress. So happy birthday. Uh, the Library of Congress uh, comes into existence thanks to the work of men who were both founding fathers and great thinkers, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson. The idea was to have a library for Congress. So initially, the Library of Congress was actually kept inside of the United States Capitol building, which was really great until August of 1814. In August of 1814, the United States is fighting in the War of 1812. British and Canadian troops are going to march down, capture the city. They're going to burn the White House and the Capitol building, destroying the original Library of Congress. Within a month, Thomas Jefferson, at this point retired from political life, offers to sell his personal collection of books back to the United States. Now, when I tell you Jefferson loved books, he loved books. Over 50 years, he had collected 6,487 books, a world-class scholarly library. He agrees to sell his books, and in 1815, Congress is willing to purchase them. So Congress purchases the entire collection for about $23,000. And Jefferson's collection of books is really what restarts the Library of Congress and becomes the base of the collection we know today. No tour of Capitol Hill is complete without a little drop in from Capitol Police. So Jefferson's collection is what gives us the base of the Library of Congress today, but the Library of Congress has grown quite a bit since 1815. Today, the library is said to have over 167 million items, 36 million books, 7 million periodicals. It has sheet music, more maps, uh, the largest cardiographical collection in the world, more maps than anybody else. Uh, they have a rare instruments collection. They have photographs and digital content, all sorts of things. Uh, and it's not just in this building you see here. There are three buildings on Capitol Hill that make up the Library of Congress, an audiovisual campus in Northern Virginia, and dozens of storage and archival facilities around the world. Of course, this building is really one of the reasons to come up to Capitol Hill. This is the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. 
completed in 1897. It became very clear uh, towards the end of the 1800s that the Library of Congress needed its own home. Uh, there were threats of fires and other things at the Capitol building, and so they needed a grand building. This building was really designed to be a temple to learning, enlightenment, and discovery. It's in a beautiful bow art style. The architect was a man named Paul Pels. If you've ever visited historic Georgetown or been on the campus of Georgetown University, you've maybe seen that beautiful Healy Hall. He was also the architect of that structure. This building looks uh, unlike any other building in Washington, D.C. You can see the ornate decoration, uh, and what you see outside is just a tiny fraction of the beautiful ornate interior. I want you to definitely notice the keystones uh, that go above the first floor windows. These represent different ethnographic groups around the world, uh, so they go all the way around the building, going from literally A to Z, Arab to Zulu. And as we get a little closer to the front of the building, you're going to notice there are busts. These are busts of great men as defined in 1897. Not all of them American, but you might recognize some of the names. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Washington Irving, and Benjamin Franklin are all included in the busts of great men. And at the very, very top of the building, you're going to notice on top of the dome a gold torch. The torch is a recurring symbol at the Library of Congress. In fact, the seal of the Library of Congress includes a torch. It's symbolism, right? It's allegorical. It represents what knowledge does. It brings light to darkness, taking us from ignorance to enlightenment. So anytime you're here at the Library of Congress, be sure to look for the torches. It's a little bit of, a, of an Easter egg here at the library. One of the more eye-catching elements to the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress is this fountain. It's the Court of Neptune, so you can see the god Neptune in the center, and he is flanked by his tritons, uh, especially in the spring and summer uh, when this fountain is on with the water splashing everywhere. It's a really photogenic, um, a great spot to take photos outside of the library. So as we leave the Library of Congress, we're going to make our way to the newest building on Capitol Hill, one of the newest buildings on Capitol Hill, the United States Supreme Court. That's right next door to the Library of Congress, so we're going to take a short walk this way. So if you take a look behind me, you're looking at this beautiful neoclassical building. This is the home of the United States Supreme Court. This hasn't always been the home of the Supreme Court, though. When uh, the Capitol building is first being constructed in the 1790s, there's really no clear instructions on where the Supreme Court is supposed to go. So the architect of the Capitol, William Thornton, will put a courtroom for the Supreme Court in the basement of the Capitol. That might give you an idea of the role of the court at the end of the 18th century. Now, um, the Supreme Court will eventually move into the old Senate chamber after the Capitol building is expanded, but finally in 1935 it'll move into this building here. This building was really the brainchild of a man that I personally love in American history and who I have done multiple videos on already, William Howard Taft. Taft is unique in American history for being the only person to serve as President of the United States and then Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And when he becomes Chief Justice, he argues uh, successfully that the Supreme Court is its own separate branch of the government and it deserves its own home. 
Now, sadly, Taft doesn't live to see this building dedicated, but we have Taft to thank uh, for this beautiful structure. Now, this is the home of the Supreme Court. The courtroom is here, the offices for the justices, all the work of the court happens inside of this building. Uh, it's pretty quiet today, but you can imagine when the Supreme Court is actually hearing cases, there can sometimes be thousands and thousands of spectators and protesters outside of the Supreme Court. Now, we're going to get a little bit closer to the building. I'm going to point out some of the artwork outside of the structure. So as we're taking a look at the United States Supreme Court building, you might notice on either side that there are two sculptures flanking the stairs. Over to the left, that woman is the contemplation of justice, so an allegorical statue. Uh, you might notice she has a figure in her hand that's actually justice. And then over to the right, that is the guardian or authority of law. So two really important concepts outside the building. If you take a look up at the pediment, you'll notice a female figure seated in the center. That's liberty enshrined. On either side, there's authority and order. And then on either side, there's a trio of men. They represent research and counsel. One thing the sculptor Richard Etkin did is he actually sculpted in some familiar faces. He included the face of William Howard Taft as a young man. He included the face of the architect Cass Gilbert. And of course, he included his own face because that's what you get to do when you're the sculptor of the, the faces at the Supreme Court building. Inside, you would find the courtroom, which itself has a lot of beautiful artwork. Uh, and the Supreme Court building is typically open to visit. So we'll put some information on how to plan your visit to the Supreme Court in the notes below. One of my favorite features of the United States Supreme Court court building are these beautiful bronze doors. Each of these doors weigh six and a half tons. So that's like 13 tons total. Uh, the doors don't swing open the way you would imagine like a door in your house might. They actually slide into a recess on either side. When you get up close to the doors, what you're seeing are important scenes from legal history. The one that I like the best is actually up near the top. Over to the right, that's Justice John Marshall, the first justice of the United States Supreme Court, sort of establishing the importance of the judicial branch. Um, these are really beautiful and look how tall they are. <laughs> So now that we've seen the Library of Congress and the Supreme Court, I'm going to take you over to the United States Capitol building. As we're walking over, though, let me know if you have any questions about the Capitol building. I'll be sure to answer them in the comments. Uh, and I want you to think about if you have questions about the exterior, if you have questions about what happens inside, or if you have questions about planning your own visit. So let's go. So we are finally here at the United States Capitol building, the heart and soul of Capitol Hill. Uh, this has been home to the United States Congress since 1800. Now, George Washington, of course, was very involved in planning the Capitol City. He would ha hand select the architect of the Capitol, the first architect, William Thornton. And of course, George Washington would lay the cornerstone here at the United States Capitol building. Of course, what we're looking at today is quite different from the Capitol building as it was originally designed. Try to imagine this building about one third of its size today today without the big dome, without the wings, without the fancy front facade, and you have the original United States Capitol building. Now Congress meets here for the first time in 1800, but they're going to come up against a challenge not too long after that in August of 1814. That is of course when the British will attack us during the War of 1812. They're going to burn the White House and the Capitol building. So the Capitol building has to be rebuilt in the interior. Congress relocates across the street uh, to a temporary location uh, and then continues to expand and grow the building. 
building. In the 1850s, Congress undertakes a massive expansion of the building, bringing it up to its current size, adding on the new chambers on either end, and then of course topping off the building with this beautiful dome. Congress was very smart, though, when it came time to build this dome. They knew that there might be a chance that this building could be attacked again. It might be burned, so they wanted to make the dome out of a fireproof material. So what we're seeing here is a dome made out of solid cast iron. It's about 9 million pounds of cast iron sitting on top of the United States Capitol building. Now, uh, cast iron is something you're probably more familiar with in your kitchen than as a building material, and there's good reason. It turns out cast iron doesn't make the best uh, building material. You might have some cast iron facade buildings left in your town or city, but most of them have started to crack, crumble, and degrade. And that's actually what happened to the United States Capitol Building Dome. They discovered that it was leaking inside, that parts of the building were falling off, and it was getting to be in really bad shape. So in 2014, they did a two-year, $60 million repair to this dome. They went in and fixed over a thousand cracks, replaced a bunch of pieces that had fallen off, and then they resealed and repainted the dome. So looking at it today in 2020, if you're thinking, I've seen the Capitol building, but this looks shinier than I remember. Just think you're seeing it with a pretty fresh coat of paint. Most importantly for the Capitol Dome for me is the figure on the top. That is the Statue of Freedom. She represents the ideal of freedom. She stands from her feet to the top of her headdress, 19 and a half feet tall. By DC tradition, no other statue in this city can stand taller than freedom. So if you think about all the incredible Americans who are honored with statues and memorials here in Washington, DC, none of those statues stand taller than she. That is because freedom stands in no man's shadow. And if you're standing here on Capitol Hill, you might notice that she's actually facing the east. That means that every morning the sun rises to greet freedom on the face. No matter how divided we feel, no matter what threats we're facing, we never see the sun set on the face of freedom here at the United States Capitol building. And I find that very reassuring. Now, if you have exceptional eyesight, you might notice that there are some words inscribed underneath freedom's feet. E pluribus unum. Latin, out of many, one. It's the founding ideal of the United States. Now let's get a little bit closer to the building. If you come up to visit the United States Capitol building today, you might be curious about which side is which, uh, because if you look at these two chambers on either side, they're identical on the exterior. To the left uh, here is the United States House of Representatives. So this is home to the 435 voting members of the House. And then over on this side is the United States Senate, home to 100 senators. Uh, there's really no way to tell that on the outside. You just have to take my word for it. Now, Congress is not in session today. We're recording this on a Saturday. Congress typically doesn't meet on a Saturday, but there's an easy way to know whether or not they're in session without even taking a look at the congressional schedule. If you take a look at the top of the chambers, you'll know that each chamber has a flag pole. When they're in session, they will fly the American flag over that chamber. You can see no flag, that means no session. If you're out at night, there's also another way you can tell whether they're meeting. Right underneath the Statue of Freedom is a light. Uh, so that beacon light is turned on anytime they're meeting in the evening. So if you see the flags or the light, that's how you know that Congress is in session. If you're interested in seeing and learning more about the United States Capitol Building, be sure to check out our other Capitol Building videos in the links below. We're gonna be taking you around the Senate side of the United States Capitol building. We're gonna show you a little bit more of the Capitol grounds and we're gonna show you one of our favorite little hidden treats. So this might seem like sort of an odd thing to stop at during our walking tour, but this is a little fun sort of insider side of Capitol Hill. You'll notice that these are all the media stations. You'll see they're denoted with different uh, channels and media groups. This is where you're often going to find your senators, because we're on the Senate side, talking to the press. So when they are announcing a big bill, when they want to answer questions or talk about an important issue, they can't actually do that inside of the United States Capitol building, or it's very limited inside the United States Capitol building in terms of places where 
where the press can record. And so they have a designated press area out here. So you might see your members of Congress out here talking about something important, and you'll have all of the media plugged in. There's another media uh, stand section on the House side as well, so they can both be doing press conferences at the same time. As you explore the Capitol grounds, you'll notice that there are beautiful trees all around the Capitol complex. There are trees from all different parts of the United States, different kinds of flora. Uh, this was part of the vision of the man uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit who renovated the Capitol grounds. But if you take a look closely at the trees, you'll notice many of them have markers. The markers help to note what kind of tree this is. This is a ginkgo biloba tree, uh, which is helpful because I'm not good at identifying trees on my own. But you'll notice that it actually was given in honor of the Arbor Lodge Association of Nebraska City, Nebraska, sponsored by Senator Curtis of Nebraska. So there are over 100 memorial trees up on Capitol Hill. We have trees that honor different groups, organizations, and important figures uh, like Anne Frank uh, has a tree here uh, and many, many others. So be sure to check that out. If you're up on Capitol Hill exploring, you can find some really interesting memorial trees and some very unusual species of trees that are not native to Washington, D.C. take time to explore the Capitol complex, you're going to notice a series of really large, beautiful marble buildings uh, that flank either side of the Capitol. These are the congressional office buildings. Today, there are seven office buildings that make up the Capitol complex. The oldest is the Cannon House office building, which is over on the House side. If you take a look behind me, though, you can see the Russell building. Uh, this is one of three buildings for United States senators. If you were coming to Washington, D.C. and hoping to meet with a member of Congress, your representative or your senator, you most likely would wouldn't meet with them or their staff in the United States Capitol building, you'd actually meet with them in their office buildings. Typically, these are open to visitors, and this is where you can come to let them know your thoughts on an issue or lobby for a particular piece of legislation. We started our virtual tour today on the east side of the United States Capitol building. When the Capitol was originally uh, constructed, that was really uh, sort of planned to be the front of the Capitol. It was uh, the side of the building that everybody was going to come and go from. Uh, but today, if we think about a front of the Capitol building, we actually tend to think of the west side of the Capitol building. The reason we do is because this is where, since President Ronald Reagan, our presidential inaugurations have been held. So every four years, if you see the president taking the oath of office on television since Ronald Reagan, what you're actually seeing is the west side of the United States Capitol building. This is the side of the building that faces towards the National Mall, where you get that incredible view of the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial and all of our wonderful museums. Now, I would love to show you where the president actually takes the oath of office up close, but here's a little, uh, little tidbit. Uh, we have a presidential election coming up and a presidential inauguration that'll be taking place in January of 2021. And even though it's only October, they're already beginning the preparation work for inauguration. It's it takes three months to construct the stage, the grandstand, all the apparatus you need here, plus all the security uh, structures that you need as well. So Capitol Police and the uh, architect of the Capitol begin work on this three months in advance. So you can start to see they're just beginning construction on the stage. Uh, this will be continuing all the way through to January of 2021. So we'll get you as close as we can, but that's the reason why you're seeing all of this blocked off. So the grounds of the United States Capitol building didn't always look as beautiful as they look today. In the late 19th century, there was a man named Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, a landscape architect most famous for his work in New York City Central Park, who was commissioned to re-envision the Capitol grounds to beautify the area. Uh, Olmsted really takes this to heart. He uh, expands the Capitol grounds area, starts putting in this plan to showcase trees and flora from all across the United States. But there is a criticism to what Olmsted has created. Uh, 
Washington DC is a hot city. In the summer, it can be hot and muggy and you had people coming to the Capitol building on horseback, uh, sometimes making a really long and strenuous journey. There was nowhere for them to cool off and nowhere to water their horses. So under pressure, Olmstead adds a summer house. That's the structure that you see here, this little red brick summer house. This was designed to be a place where both people and horses could cool off, enjoy some shade and find water. The water fountain here was initially fed by a spring, so it was nice spring water, and they would have had decorative drinking cups that were attached to this basin by chains, so you would have uh, been able to use the cup that was here. One thing that I find really interesting is in his letters, Olmsted sort of has a bit of a problem. He obviously doesn't want this to disrupt the view of the United States Capitol. He wants it to be sort of tucked away. But if it's too private, he worries that people will get into unsavory activities inside. So he has to sort of balance out making sure that it's subtle, but without making it a place where people could hide away and do something nefarious. Olmsted originally planned to do two summer houses, one on the north side where we are now and one on the south side. Unfortunately, this is the only one that ever gets built. If you take a look at the west side of the United States Capitol building, you'll notice, of course, the American flag. The flag underneath that, that black flag, is the POW MIA flag, Prisoner of War Missing in Action. We fly that flag at the White House in the United States Capitol building, as well as, as, well as all of our war memorials on the National Mall. But if you look, you'll see columns, and right underneath those columns is a black wrought iron sort of gate. That is the Speaker's balcony. The Speaker of the House is one of a handful of members of Congress who actually have their offices inside of the United States Capitol building. So for a rarefied few, you actually get to have your office inside this building. And one of the perks of being, speakers of being Speaker of the House is that you get this balcony that gives you absolutely incredible views of the National Mall. And if you're here when Congress is in session, you might actually see members of Congress up on the Speaker's balcony, or you might see some of their friends and guests enjoying that view. So we're looking down Pennsylvania Avenue. This is also known as America's Main Street. It's about one mile from where we're standing, straight down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House. Uh, if you've ever watched the inaugural parade on television, this is the inaugural parade route. It starts here at the United States Capitol building, goes straight down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House. As you come around to the west side of the United States Capitol building, there's a trio of Civil War statuary. Right here is the peace statue. The peace statue celebrates our peace after the Civil War and the reunification of our country. It also honors all the naval deaths from the Civil War. There's also a memorial to Ulysses S. Grant, who was General of the Union Army, later President of the United States, which we're going to see next. And on the other side is a statue of President James Garfield. If you're interested about learning more about Garfield or Grant, be sure to check out our podcast, Tour Guide Tell All, where we go a little more in depth about their stories and their memorials. So uh, beautiful views here of the United States Capitol building reflecting pool. This is not the reflecting pool from Forrest Gump. I'm just going to go ahead and answer that question right away. That reflecting pool is down on the other side of the National Mall by the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. But this is our Capitol reflecting pool. If you were standing on the other side, uh, you get a reflection of the Capitol building. But my favorite part of the pool is really kind of small and silly. But if you take a look over here, you're going to notice a ramp. 
and you might be wondering why why would you have a little ramp here but it's actually to help the baby ducklings every spring when the ducklings are born they're way too little to get over the hump of the side of the reflecting pool so what the capital uh, the architect of the capital did was actually have these ramps constructed to help the baby ducks get in and out which i just think is very cute so from the west side of the Capitol, we're getting a much better view of where the stage is being built for the inauguration. Uh, they do this every four years. So a stage is actually built. Uh, the president-elect is going to walk out of the building. You can sort of see the archway that's open. The president-elect will walk through uh, those open doors right out onto the stage. Uh, so the stage is not here permanently. It's built especially for the inauguration. You can, of course, understand why President Ronald Reagan wanted to move the inauguration to this side of the Capitol, because this is the view that you're getting. You can see our beautiful National Mall. It's two miles from where we're standing down to the Lincoln Memorial and one mile from where we're standing to our Washington Monument. And between us are our Smithsonian Museums and our memorials. If you're interested in seeing or learning more about any of those things, be sure to check out our other videos and virtual tours so you can get an insider's glimpse to the Smithsonian Museums and the National Mall. Thank you so much for joining us today for our virtual tour of Capitol Hill. If you have any questions, be sure to drop them into the comments. We'll be happy to answer them. We have a lot of great tours happening in Washington, D.C., and a lot of great virtual tours happening all around the United States. So be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a single video. If you're visiting Washington, D.C. soon or you know somebody who is, be sure to send this video to them so they can get all the insider tips to Capitol Hill. Thank you so much for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you on another tour.